What are the three most important things that we need as an ambassador for Christ? That's the topic for today's episode of The Garrison. We live in a world where there is more access to information than ever before. Generations, young and old, are being exposed to radically different ideologies and opinions every day. It can be so overwhelming trying to decipher what's true and what's false. But there is a way. Join me as we discuss some of the toughest questions out there about Christianity, the Bible, and culture. I'm your host, Nick Lackey. Welcome to The Garrison. Welcome back to another episode of The Garrison. Thanks for joining me today. I'm super excited to get into today's topic, which I mentioned before, which was what are three things that we need as an ambassador for Christ? And we're going to talk about that. But first of all, I'd just like to say that anything good from this podcast, any uh, bit of information that you benefit from, that's all coming from God, okay? Any of the rubbish in this podcast, hopefully there's not any, but if there is, then that's all on me. Uh, So please ignore any rubbish. Lord willing, I don't say anything that is rubbish, but let's get into it. We're going to start off by looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 21, where it talks about being an ambassador for Christ. So here we go. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. In verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that last verse is so beautiful. It's such a good sum up of the gospel. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So going back to verse 20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And so as an ambassador of Christ, which every Christian is, what are three important things that we need to be good and effective ambassadors? And so today I'm going to argue that those three things are knowledge, wisdom, and character. So let's get into it. Number one, knowledge. An ambassador needs knowledge. And an ambassador for anything will need knowledge, right? They need to know what they are being an ambassador for. Therefore, they must train themselves and teach themselves and they must learn about what they are representing. And in the Bible, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And as Christians, we have this hope of the resurrection. We have this hope of uh, an eternity in heaven because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. And so we always need to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who questions us about it. And we will come back to 1 Peter 3.15 and the following verses because there's some other great stuff in there. But we'll focus on this for now. So we must always be prepared with the knowledge to give. And there's two ways that we can be prepared in this realm of knowledge. And that's being on the offense and the defense. And when I say offense and defense, this perhaps can be understood better by having answers but also having questions, okay? So when people ask us a question about Christianity, we must have the answers for them, right? And so that is an example of the defense, but the offense is more of a asking questions to maybe start a conversation with someone or get them to think. So to sum it up, I'd say offense is asking questions and presenting evidence to support an argument. But defense is answering questions that people have for us and providing explanations and evidence to support our positions. And so as a Christian, I'm not saying that we need knowledge for every single tiny little question or uh, a lot of people have these little trick questions for us. We don't always have to be have this excellent answer for everything. But as Christians, we should all have knowledge of the fundamentals, knowledge of the kind of core parts of Christianity. And I'd argue that they are the origin. We must know where we came from. We must know how this world was created. That's the origin, right? We also need to know our meaning and our purpose in this life. We need to know where morality comes from. 
and we must also know our destiny, where we are going to, right? And of course, uh, in amongst morality and destiny and meaning and purpose, uh, we can always be talking about the cross of Jesus Christ as well and the fact that he died for us on that cross for our sin. But we have to have this knowledge, this funda foundational knowledge, just as an ambassador for maybe a sports brand must have knowledge of the, uh, the ethic of the company or the goal of the company. And they must know probably the biggest uh, items which are on sale or they must know if, if I work for Nike, I'd probably want to know that we sell Nike running shoes. Okay, so we need to have knowledge of these essentials of the kingdom of God. And we also have to have knowledge of the bad ideas that people are raising against Christianity. We need to find out from culture what these bad ideas are. And I see a problem uh, amongst the church today in that often we isolate ourselves and our children, if you're a parent, from bad ideas. You know, maybe kids are... Uh, I, and it's a fair enough concern, right? We don't want kids to be exposed to these horrible ideas as an early age. We don't want them to be indoctrinated into these bad ideas. But we, I, instead of, well, we isolate them from these bad ideas, right? Maybe they're homeschooled or they're sent to a Christian school, um, which aren't bad things in themselves. But Or maybe they're only allowed Christian friends, but they never get exposed to these bad ideas. But look, reality is eventually people will end up in the real world and they'll hear these bad ideas about Christianity. They'll start hearing these tricky questions about Christianity. And if we've isolated them, and this includes yourself as well, if you've isolated yourself from these bad ideas for your whole life, then by the time they come round, and they will, you're not going to be prepared to give an answer. So I would argue, instead of isolating yourself from bad ideas, inoculate yourself. Or instead of isolating your children, inoculate your children with these bad ideas. It's a bit like a vaccine, right? A vaccine works because you put a little bit of the disease into someone so that they learn to fight it so that when the actual thing comes, their body is prepared to fight off the real disease. In the same way, if we inoculate ourselves with the bad ideas about Christianity in a controlled environment, this means that we are talking to our kids about the bad ideas people have about Christianity. It means we're looking up the bad ideas online and we're finding out questions that people have about Christianity. That by the time we're actually in a conversation in real life and someone raises that bad idea, we would actually be prepared. And Jesus does this with his disciples. He didn't shelter them from bad ideas. Scripture says he sent his disciples out as sheep among wolves. And this was an effective way of training them. So first thing we need is knowledge. Number two, we'll move on. Number two is wisdom. All right, the skill to be dip, diplomatic and the skill of maneuvering a conversation. Once we have the knowledge, we have to know how to present that knowledge and how to have a conversation with someone. If you're watching on video right now, you may see that I'm, I'm breathing out uh, steam. It's very cold in my studio right now. It snowed overnight and I didn't have enough time to put the, uh, put the heater on for long. So... Um, I'm a, I'm a little bit freezing. I'm not shivering yet, which is good. Anyway, back to it. Wisdom. We do need wisdom, okay? Now, how do we maneuver a conversation? How do we stay in the driver's seat, okay? And I want to talk about something which is called, or which I've heard people call, the Colombo tactic. Now, funny enough, my studio is actually on Colombo Street, but this is a, a different type of Colombo. There is a, uh, I haven't seen it myself, but I believe there is a TV show of a detective called Colombo, and what he would do uh, this show went on for a few decades, and what he would do in order to figure out the uh, the murder mystery was he would ask questions, right? And he would gather information. And in the same way as Christians or as ambassadors for Christ, we have to ask questions. And so number one, we must use questions to gather information. We need to find out more. And a great question to ask when people raise up uh, or if they ask you a tricky question about Christianity, or if they make a statement about Christianity, ask them, what do you mean by that? Because people can mean many different things when they say, or they make a statement about Christianity. As good ambassadors, we have to ask them, what do you mean by that? What are you actually saying right now? You know, words, sometimes words have multiple meanings. You have to figure out what meaning they are referring to. And so we need to gather information and find out what that person is actually saying or what they are actually asking. And number two, once you find out what they believe or where they're coming from, find out why. Why are they asking that? Or why are they making that statement? And a great question here is, how did you come to that conclusion? 
what steps led you to having this opinion that you're presenting right now? What experiences did you have in your life that led you to asking this question about God? This is so vital as I feel, and I've done this so many times myself, where someone will make a statement about Christianity or they will ask a question and then I'm just straight away, boom, 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 you know, trying to give uh, answers to them and trying to uh, just, I guess, talk over them a lot of the time. And it's not a good way of conversing with people. It's not a very loving way. Instead, we must ask questions. And Jesus did this as well. Often when the Pharisees and the religious leaders would come up to him and they would try to catch him out with a tricky question. I'm brought to that story and um, oh, I don't know. I can't remember where it is in the Bible. Somewhere. Definitely. In the Gospels. That's as close as I'll get. Where Jesus heals a man, I think, on the Sabbath. And then, um, you know, uh, the religious leaders, I think they ask him, man, I should have prepared for this. They ask him, um, you know, you're, you're doing work on the Sabbath and, um, oh dear, I feel like I'm butchering this story. Oh, well, I'll continue on. But, and then Jesus, I think he, uh, instead of just giving an answer, I think he asked them, what's it better to do is, uh, I need to find this story. All right. If you're watching, I'm going to cut it here and go find the story. Here we go. I found it. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remain silent. So you can see here that Jesus um, Jesus was asking a question. He wasn't making a statement. He asked them a question. And they remained silent because they knew that there was an obvious answer which would contradict what they were trying to do. Verse 5, He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the uh, Herodians how they might kill Jesus. They didn't like that. But Jesus did the right thing because, well, obviously he did the right thing, but he asked questions, okay? And that is what we must do as ambassadors as well, asking questions. Those two very important questions to gather information and to find out more, we ask, what do you mean by that? And then once we find out what they believe, find out why. How did you come to that conclusion? An example, I'll give you an example. This is a made-up example, but someone might say, Christianity is a white man's religion. Or maybe a rich white man's religion used to control people. Now, if you jump straight in with reasons why it's not actually a rich white man's religion, and you start trying to disprove their statement, of which you don't actually really know much about, how's that going to go, realistically? I've done that before when people have made a statement similar to this, and it hasn't gone well. People often, they've got their shields up, they're trying to just make statements and then, and then run away. It's like leaving a comment on a comment section, you know? Many people aren't actually prepared to have that proper conversation, but... Instead, what if we replied, what do you mean by that? The person might reply, well, I think it's religion that helps white men and it oppresses other people. And then we ask them, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Then they say, well, I grew up with a bunch of white men who used the Bible to say that they have authority over other people and that they can control them. Then you might ask, well, have you ever looked into the Bible itself to see what the Bible says about this? Or have you ever considered that the founder of Christianity, Jesus, was not... A white man and that none of the Bible was written by what you are referring to as a white man hmm you know it starts to get the other person to think you start to uncover their real motives and you know asking questions it's just so important I was having a conversation this is a real example I was having a conversation with a boy from my high school group and he was trying to explain where morality come from or uh, came from not come from and I kept asking him questions. I would say, he, he might say, well, society determines morality. And we've talked about this on the garrison before. And he was saying society determines morality and it's, it's all dependent on the greater good of society. And I said, well, according to who? Who said that that's the standard? He said, well, no one. We've kind of just agreed upon society that as a society we can determine morality. So I said, well, what about the Nazi society? If they all agreed that what they did during the Holocaust was correct and good and, and true, then... 
can I keep doing that? He said, well, no, because the overall world society. So I said, well, what if we had, you know, 60% of the world thought that slavery was okay and 40% disagreed? Well, the majority of society would say that slavery is okay. Therefore, is it good? He said, well, no. And then, you know, he kind of just got backed up into a corner. And I didn't make any statements throughout this. All I was doing was asking questions. So it's so important. And the second part of wisdom that we have to talk about is clarity, right? We can ask great questions and when we, and look, we, we can make statements as well, right? Questions are just important at the start of the conversation and throughout the conversation. But as Christians, we can still make statements about what we do believe. We can affirm truths, but we must do it in a way which is clear. Clarity is important. So to be persuasive, we need to be clear. And one thing I would do and uh, warn people about is using religious terminology. Now, I'm not saying we cannot use Bible verses. Or I'm not saying we cannot talk about the Bible. But in order to be clear, we have to consider how that person is understanding what we say. And so maybe if I'm talking about sanctification to someone, if they've never been to church before, if they've never read the Bible, are they going to understand what that means? If I talked about sub substitutionary atonement with someone, are they going to understand what on earth that is saying? Even when we talk about the Holy Spirit, some people just, they've never heard of the Trinity before. So we must remember that we are talking to people who aren't necessarily Christians. They don't necessarily understand, the, yeah, they're definitely not Christians, but they may not understand the words that we are using. So maybe talking more of their language, that doesn't mean compromise in biblical truths or anything but find other words to explain it. So maybe instead of talking about faith, we can talk about trust or, or your convictions. And instead of saying the Bible said, maybe say Jesus said this, and they understand that it's not just, I mean, the books can't speak, but the person in the book, Jesus, he spoke. I mean, in the first century, there was no Bible. So I don't think, uh, I mean, we had the Old Testament, but they didn't call it the Bible. So I don't think in the, in the uh, did I say First Testament? First century. Maybe I did say first century. But in the first century, they didn't, uh, the apostles, when they were doing evangelism and talking to people, they wouldn't have said, hey, the Bible said this back then. No, instead, they would have spoken in the language in which the people they were witnessing to could understand. So that's important as well, to be, clar uh, to be clear and to have clarity. And remember to have grace as well. And our goal when we have these conversations with people is to stay in the driver's seat. And finally, character. The last thing which I think is important as an ambassador for Christ. And I, I promised before that we will get back to 1 Peter 3.15. So here we are. After it tells us to always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have, it says, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now just imagine if you had someone who was an ambassador for a, uh, for a country maybe, an ambassador for a country, but they were a drunk ambassador. It wouldn't be a good look, would it? Or an ambassador for any company. If they were drunk or if they lived a horrible lifestyle and they were just horrible to everybody, it would not be <coughs> a good way of being an, an effective ambassador. It's the same when we are an ambassador for Christ. We must maintain a good Christ-like character. And when we're having a conversation, I learned this off on standtoreason.org, uh, great website. And I, uh, I heard the, the lecturer say, if I get mad in a conversation, then I lose. If they get mad in the conversation, they lose as well. So and it, as our goal, uh, or our goal as an ambassador should be that no one is getting mad in the conversation, right? Now, obviously, we cannot control what the other person does. If we are being as truthful and as graceful as we can be, we're being respectful and polite, and the other person gets mad because we're speaking biblical truth, that's just the way it is. And we can't do much, but we can. what we can control is the way we speak to people, maybe where we speak to people. You know, we've got to bring it up at the right moment. Now, I think there's always a... Well, maybe 99% of the time, is a, it's a great time to start a conversation about Christianity. But, uh, I mean, I'm being extreme here. But, you know, if there's someone on the, uh, I think I heard this analogy as well from someone. But if if you're a woman and you were uh, going through labor, about to give birth, and then you're clutching at the doctor's arm and then trying to give the gospel to them. You know, sometimes there aren't actually acceptable times to 
preach the gospel. But use wisdom. I'm saying definitely we always probably miss opportunities to be preaching the gospel and to start these conversations with people. But use wisdom and find the right opening and the right in to talk to people about this. And so that first thing about if I get mad, I lose. You don't want to get mad as an, as an ambassador. That is not a good idea. And if they get mad, you lose as well. Because once people start getting really emotional, then often the conversation, uh, you, neither of you can really benefit from it either. And another principle which is good to remember is not to be too naughty or too nice. Okay, When we're dealing with biblical truths, we definitely do not want to be too, well, in this expression, be too naughty. Okay, in other words, we don't want to be just coming across with like an iron fist and being really uh, strong-willed. And uh, if we don't ask questions to people, you know, this is an example here as well. This is why wisdom and and uh, character go hand in hand as well, as well with knowledge. But we can't be just being too mean or angry. We've got to let the other person speak, you know. So don't be too naughty, but don't be too nice either. Don't compromise on biblical truths in order to try and make the conversation all settled. We must be absolutely truthful about what we're saying. We cannot compromise any biblical truths at all, otherwise we have failed. And so the two things for character, which are really important, if you get mad, you lose. If they get mad, you lose. Don't be too naughty or too nice. You've got to balance grace and truth. The Bible speaks about that as well, to speak the truth and love. And some handy tips, practical tips to be using in the conversation is use their name. Ask for their name. That always lightens up a conversation when you use their name. Tell them that that's a good point. That's a good question. I used to have that question as well. Or I could be wrong about this, but this is currently where I stand. You know, use these kind of phrases and expressions, which really, uh, they really just make you seem like more of a, a person. You're not just a robot spitting out facts and statements, but you're, you're a person just like they are, and it's a great way of relating to them as well. And look, if our goal is only to be nice, I heard this saying once, you will never be able to out-nice a Mormon. If you just heard that train whistle, that's my phone. I've left uh, the ringtone on, which is not good from, from me as a podcaster. Anyway, that's off now. I don't know if you heard that. You will never be able to out-nice a Mormon, okay? They're very nice people. They're wrong, but they're nice. Now, being nice in itself isn't enough. The good news is not good news without bad news. Okay, Christianity is great news, but there's bad news that comes as well. The bad news is that we're all guilty sinners who have broken God's law and deserve to go to hell. But the good, the best news is that Jesus, out of his love for us, has died on that cross and paid the price of our sin in full. That if we repent of our sin and put our faith in him, then we will be forgiven. Okay? Now, the, the message of the gospel is an offensive message. People don't like to be told that they're sinners and that they, that they deserve hell. So it's offensive enough. We don't need to add offense by being really nasty about it. But we can't take any offense out of the gospel for the sake of the person we're speaking to either. We must speak it as it is. Trust that the Holy Spirit will be working in that person to bring conviction and to show them the love that God has for them as well. So finally, to, to recap on everything, ambassadors need to have these three things. Knowledge that must be equipped with the answers to Christianity, to the questions people have about Christianity. We must have wisdom. We must know how to maneuver in conversations, how to ask questions. And we've talked about those two questions about uh, how did you come to that conclusion and what do you mean by that? Two great questions to be asking. And finally, character. We must have a good Christ-like character in our conversations with people. We can't be getting angry. We can't be just... Uh, talking over people. We must be Christ-like and we must have a good character. Don't be too naughty. Don't be too nice. Be humane about it. And that is how we can be more effective and more Christ-like ambassadors for him and for the good news. So that's the end of this episode. I really hope and I pray that you guys can benefit from this stuff. If you do, or if you did, and please make sure to share this podcast with other people so that they can learn as well. Uh, they can learn along with, with all of us because I'm learning through this process as well. And uh, feel free to give me any feedback. I'd love to hear what people are thinking of these episodes. Um, and also, if you would like to rate this podcast on wherever you're listening to, that would help that reach more people as well. So thank you for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of The Garrison.